And when we have an open door a day, uh, the institute and uh, the people come and to see the tests, and they can't believe that the specimen doesn't go bang. You know? uh, if you do a, a load control test, the specimen goes bang at a certain point, of course, because you can't increase the force anymore. But if it's uh, uh, strain controlled, you can drive the crack all the way through until nothing is left. So this is uh, like rubber metal can uh, really behave kind of like rubber. So um, we measure it. It is a measurement method, but we can also use the delta five as a crack driving force parameter. And uh, I'm not going into the details anymore. Um, it is simply for fully plastic conditions. I mean, it's only fully plastic conditions where these mismatch arguments really make sense, okay? If you are totally linear elastic, then plasticity doesn't, doesn't matter. So this is simply a transfer of the power law to a strain curve to the heating net section. And once we have reached the hinge point here using linear elastic factor mechanics, we can extrapolate into the fully plastic region just by a straight line with the slope of n. And n is a straight hard experiment. It's that simple. Um, and this is the relevant equation. I replace the strain with the a displacement. Um, and the stress is replaced with the by force. And uh, that's it. Forget about the J integral here, but it's a very similar relationship. And the point is, what I should say, um, an important quantity is the heat load. This hinge point here, because, uh, as I will dwell on this later, um, because it is the point up to which we can use this, a little bit of uncertainty methods of linear elastic factor mechanics. So something that is relatively simple, where we have solutions in handbooks and so on and so forth, so it makes life easy. But when it uh, uh, comes to fully plastic uh, um, behavior, then um, this fails, of course, and uh, the uh, trivial solution is doing uh, finite element analysis, which are being done, of course, but uh, for many problems, it is sufficient to have just this simple linear extrapolation uh, using the straight party exponent. So you need to do a stress drain test, and you need the stress intensity factor solutions for here. That's it. And the, the beauty here is that due to normalization here by these points here, by these quantities, this equation is size and geometry independent. So you can use this equation for any kind of structure. You just need stress intensity factor, you need the stress strain curve, and then you have to determine the yield load, and that's it. These quantities here, these and these here, and can be calculated using the elastic fraction mechanics. It's really very simple. We have a special problem with the heat uh, load, which I'm going to detail uh, later. And um, once you have the solution for the heat load, we have solved 90% of the problem. Okay, again, uh, this compound material with the two different stress rate curves, and they are stacked. And uh, because here we have uh, I, the same stresses, the stress in the uh, base material is the same as in the development and vice versa down here. And uh, so we equate the stresses, and then we can solve for anything uh, what we'd like to have. So, my first simple analysis uh, was the following. Uh, the assumptions uh, are by stress. Each model lives on assumptions. Please don't forget this. We are always making models, although we, most, in most cases we don't realize that, that we are making models, that we are not describing reality, the total reality. Of course, we are not, it's not irrelevant or uh, unreal, but it is not the total uh, reality. And, um, uh, plain stress for thin wall structures, lightweight structures, uh, short cracks to make to keep the problem simple. So it's the infinitely wide sheet, nominally infinitely wide sheet, and uh, no interaction uh, inter that comes later, as you can see. Very interesting uh, topic. 
no interaction between base plate and belt metal in terms of stress concentrations or whatever, which, uh, or whatever, which happen, but uh, that's something that we will see later. And uh, yeah, what I just uh, said, and then uh, we uh, can determine the delta 5, as I've shown in that uh, longer equation. And in order to make the mismatch uh, effect better visible, I normalized the CTOD of a crack in the belt metal. The crack of the same size would have in the base plate. Okay. Because it's always the base plate the engineer is used to work with, and everything should be related to what's happening with the base material. So this was um, the basic solution to the simple graph, the schematical graph here. And uh, the nice thing is that with such an analytical solution, you can calculate here, you see with these simple formulas, such these simple equations that, uh, that I showed you before, so it's just a little bit of arithmetics. And um, by the way, these arithmetics will not be the subject of your contest, uh, not, that, not that hard. Um, and you can uh, have these hinge points, and from these hinge points, you can draw straight lines. Everything is done on Earth. Uh, you can draw straight lines um, if you have the, as soon as you have the hardly exponents. It's very simple. Although at first glance, of course, it looks a bit complex, but it isn't. Now, this is a um, concrete example, and I tried to convince you that. Uh, an already relatively small undermatch of 30% gives us a uh, very high um, uh, substantial increase in the crack driving force. Well, it's not exactly an order of magnitude, but here it's of well, seven times or whatever it is. Uh, had, had we 0 0.65, it would certainly be at least an order of magnitude. Something similar happens with overmatch, but here uh, it's, uh, it's positive because um, the base plate can already go plastic substantially without um, having a large uh, crack driving force at a crack in the well metal. Now this is a totally different graph. This bit, uh, you have to uh, switch over to um, another uh, representation of these results. You can use the delta 5 as a crack driving force and with a totally different normalization to make this thing um, um, free of, of quantity, so it's just a number and um, it's normalized by the modulus of elasticity, by the crack size, high is just for beauty and here we have the heat strength or you can replace this by the mismatch factor at the heat strength of the base plate. And um, again, this is plotted as a function of the strain in the base plate normalized by its heat strength. Here we have linear elasticity. Here the base plate gets plastic. And um, so this is the behavior of the base material. No belt, nothing. Uh, the driving force increases with increased strain in the linear elastic regime here. And then, uh, when it, uh, the belt, as a base plate goes plastic, we have a slope here, um, slope one, which is due to all this uh, kind of normalization. And uh, when we have undermatch, you see an increase of the crack driving force, uh, an increase of the crack driving force. Over that, in the, the base plate here, factor of kind of seven or whatever it is. And uh, again, the slopes can be calculated using the same market exponents, the same for uh, overmatch here. So, and here's the equation for delta 5 in uh, the crack driving, the normalized crack driving force in this regime, and here in this regime. So, we have equations for everything. Then we can use this here, you see the crack size. Uh, we can solve the equation for um, critical crack sizes for a given applied load and for a given fracture toughness in terms of delta 5 critical. And we insert delta 5 criti critical that we have uh, determined in the test. We know the modulus of elasticity. Uh, we know this. High is always supposed to be known. And uh, so we solve for critical crack size. And uh, 
This is shown here. The applied force normalized by the effort in the red lemma could also have normalized it to by uh, the force in the, the base state. And I gave you a specific example, which is a bit typical of offshore steels, not lightweight, but the principles are the same. I just had the data. I was too lazy to create a new diagram for lightweight materials, but in principle it's the same thing. Um, and uh, by the way, lazy, I wasn't too lazy. It took me almost four months to create all these diagrams here. And uh, here this is um, linear elastic conditions. And down here you have the slope given by uh, about the exponent. And what you see here is the lower the applied force, of course, the longer is the critical set track size, which makes sense, which is uh, obvious. And um, at the higher the Harding exponent, you don't see the, the, the substantial role that the Harding exponent plays here. I think it was this. Um... Okay. Now comes a more complicated case. Um, when we account for interaction between uh, mechanical interaction between these two components and uh, we have a different heat mode which has to be determined uh, independently and uh, which is no longer now given by the heat strength times the net cross section as we have seen um, uh, on uh, Monday morning you know we said the simplest case is um, um, yield strength times the cross section gives us yield force here. Uh, now the things are a bit more complicated as we will see in a moment. Um, my postdoc Su Hao from uh, uh, Beijing um, did this analysis, most of this analysis, using uh, yield line theory and also doing some kind of element uh, work. And uh, now with the most interesting uh, case is strong undermatch or extreme undermatch when the environment stays elastic and just the strip becomes plastic. It's very, really very extreme. So a strong constraint is exerted from the environment onto uh, the yielding strip. Now, this uh, takes a little bit of explanation. Uh, this is a complete plate here, and the left hand diagram shows uh, this uh, sector from the, uh, the complete plate. Crack tip is here, and um, there is a base plate, and here the red circle. And the slip lines here, you, you see the, the, the slip lines here, um, gives the um, uh, deformation pattern uh, of this uh, soft strip which is constrained and the most puzzling result, I mean we are not the first ones, but we are the first to do it um, for uh, this kind of, uh, of structure is that extremely high stresses are created within that strip, extremely high stresses and um, here at, at the very tip, no hardening, uh, thick line theory uh, works on uh, ideal and plastic materials. The maximum stress here is 2.4 times uh, the yield strength, so a bit more than twice the yield strength, no hardening involved. And it stays constant when you go away from the crack tip, but then the local stress increases. Which is a contrast to common belief because the common belief is that at the, the neighborhood of a notch of a stress razor you have high stresses. This is here not the case. So at first glance it looks a bit perverse, you know. Yet the high stress is far away, far away from the crack tip. And uh, so we need to reach here so stress peak and then the stress decays again when we go closer to the uh, 
backtrace here of this uh, test piece or structure, whatever it is. Well, this is really uh, kind of interesting. And um, here you can predict even the slope here. It is uh, given by uh, a constant. And the yield strength of uh, the belt uh, level here. And um, the interesting thing is the thinner or the narrower you make the strip, the higher become the stress peak. Theoretically, uh, the stress peak goes up to the theoretical strength of the material. There's no limit. On paper, of course, there's no limit. And uh, when you do the analysis for a crack in the middle here um, of the uh, middle, or uh, the interface, there is not much difference. Uh, the interesting point here is this analysis was done for this plane, okay, for the center plane, for the crack path plane. And uh, so how did the same thing for the crack still staying here? But for the situation here at the interface, there's not, uh, not uh, very much of a difference. So this is really puzzling, and uh, we found that very interesting. And applications, uh, when they ask for applications, uh, uh, they can be manifold. Uh, for example, for microelectronics, you know, when you have uh, thin uh, metal foils between ceramics or glass uh, pieces, which is a classic case for this, uh, for bonded structures, where the bond material uh, is given by a very thin, um, relatively soft strip, and so on and so forth. You, you can think about uh, any kind of, of combination. Uh, this uh, really matters. Yeah, this shows um, the same thing, the same problem, and um, it is, as we will see later, the governing parameter here. I said when you make the strip thinner, then this and that happens. The <coughs> governing parameter is the distance here, the remaining ligament, normalized by the width of this strip here. It is shown here on this horizontal axis. X1 is this distance here. And H is the width here, or half width, depending on the definition. And so this ratio is what dictates, uh, from the geometrical point of view, dictates what happens inside the soft strip. And um, here um, I've shown you one, two, three, four parameters. This is a long term. You see 14, W minus H is a is this here, normalized by H. Here is this uh, very long remaining ligament, 14. Then um, there is something uh, that we have here, two different stresses, sigma 1, 1, M, and 2, 2 here. And uh, these ones are for short ligaments, relatively short ligaments, where this P in the end has no longer a chance to build up. Okay? So you see, it drops before it can reach a, a, a peak here. Now, what I said uh, in words a few minutes ago, you Jack in from Korea, uh, did a similar analysis using parallelment analysis. So this is the um, stress in uh, opening direction. You open uh, the stress uh, perpendicular to the crack. And again, as a function of this parameter, and the crack in the middle of the well level um, exhibits um, this maximum, this peak here. This peak, you see the slope that we have seen before. And uh, this is what uh, it happens at the tip that stays constant. So this is at the crack tip, and this is far away uh, at the peak, uh, uh, the, the peak here. Before an HAZ heat affected zone, which means at the, the interface would have been replaced by the word interface, um, it's almost the same picture. Almost the same picture. In fact, it's not that I didn't expect it, but uh, when you do one analysis and you know more or less uh, the situation for, for the other case. Now, 
um, can we also uh, calculate uh, stress reactivity for this case here, a bimaterial case, not a strip uh, squeeze between uh, a, a substrate. Here it is a high strength material, a low strength material, and the fact of the interface tension and uh, bending. Here it's um, this is the low strength material here, the stress danger, the high strength material down here. And um, the main result is that triaxiality is higher at the lower strength side as on the higher strength side. This is high strength, low strength. You see, triaxiality increases with increasing mismatch. If there were no big mismatch, there wouldn't be any difference, of course. But uh, with some mismatch and increasing amount of mismatch, you see that the triaxiality increases here and here it decreases because you can, I mean, try to understand it that uh, the soft side uh, unloads, so to speak, the rotation mass unloads the harder side here and vice versa. So there's constraint exerted from here onto that. And this is a problem where my simple analysis that I showed you in the beginning doesn't work anymore. Um, I mean, it, it would work in terms of the driving force delta 5, but what about the right-hand side? The materials resistance. When we measure fracture toughness, we have standard specimens, plain stress or plain strain, thick or thin, whatever. And now here we have variable constraints uh, for which we have no test methods. So I have to think about how do I characterize the material. And that's where simple classical fracture mechanics breaks down. And we need numerical uh, methods, numerical analysis. Um, yeah. We have a twofold effect here. Number one, on the soft side, as we have seen previously, we have a higher a formal factory mechanics quite time force in terms of JOC TOD, plus a higher degree of triaxiality. So this is a even higher uh, load, so to speak, of the material. And this has to be accounted for. So it can, can't be done with classic factory mechanics. The porous plasticity, for example, is, is certainly a good uh, Now inverts, they deviate substantially from those of the homogeneous case. Homogeneous case means we have only the hard material or only the soft one. And uh, what I thought is that the most interesting configuration is a soft strip in a hard environment, which is may serve as a model for undermatched welds or metal foil between ceramic or glass parts or adhesive or solar material between elastic substrates, for example. I think these are classic examples. Now, uh, once again, uh, this conclusion under mesh, we have higher stress triaxiality at the crack tip in the strip. We have lower stress triaxiality at the crack uh, in the strip. Lower driving force in terms of delta or J, and lower uh, driving force uh, and, and lower triaxiality. Um, of course, again, when it's compared to the homogeneous case, where the complete body may consist of the strip material, strip uh, material metal only. Well, I'm referring to diagrams that we have just seen. Yeah. Uh, once again. Um, uh, for repetition, the, uh, the case of the the interface, we have high triaxiality and high strains at the soft side. The reverse is true at the hard side. And once again, uh, see the diagrams. And um, now we understand our ex experiments better, at least qualitatively. Um, this is the picture I showed you um, yesterday. And now we understand why the crack deviates from the hard and brittle heat-affected zone into 
the soft but high toughness uh, excuse me, belt angle, we have high crack drive force and high drive stability. So there is uh, an almost irresistible uh, pull down into the softer part. And um, at least, uh, here I'm only talking about the left hand side of the equation. Replace driving force by driving force plus drive stability. And the right hand, I didn't say anything about the right hand side. Uh, the, uh, a better uh, fracture toughness or better resistance may overweight or overbalance the higher crack fiber force, or vice versa. So both sides have to be considered. And also here, this is another case. Here there was a uh, crack in the um, center of the band panel. And uh, fortunately enough, the crack initiated not at the pre existing crack, but at the interface. <coughs> which uh, had we known anything, uh, had we known nothing about what I was just explaining to you, we wouldn't have understood this kind of behavior. Now we understand at least qualitatively, uh, because here we have high stresses, and uh, could also have happened here. You see, the crank is here, there, and later this was linked up, and uh, this is here the explanation. Once again, the same thing here, the power plane welding is a hard and brittle uh, fusion zone, high overmatch about a factor of four, and nevertheless the uh, crack deviates into the high toughness base plate uh, because uh, here the driving force is high. The same here on the left hand side. The same here, of course, uh, you know, we have a soft blood um, metal and Cracking with the crack line force, and most probably we didn't look at the crack pass. Unfortunately, most probably the crack deviated here. So, qualitatively, everything here is understandable. You know, I don't know how deeply you had ever gone into welding or testing or weldments. Uh, some welders, some people who investigate welds try to find out the so-called intrinsic fracture toughness of a specific microstructure. So they make specimens of weld metal, they make specimens of the heat affected zone, you can make relatively large specimens by a, a appropriate thermocycle to mimic the coarse grain heat affected zone, so it's a so-called Gleeble machine where you can do all these uh, uh, thermal cycle, heat cycle, and then you measure fracture toughness, which is interesting, of course, because we learn about the properties of the microstructure. But what did we learn here? This alone doesn't matter. It's the compound that matters. It's the interactions between the various areas of different plastic properties of different toughnesses. So this alone is uh, not a... If the goal is uh, characterizing the weld as such, uh, it is wasted time and money. Now, this is another interesting example. This is a Japanese work by Michiba. Uh, he did um, um, R curves in terms of the J level and uh, on CT specimens, three different CT specimens. He made a CT specimen out of 100% completely out of the belt panel here. And this is the R curve. And then he had a specimen with base plate at the same belt metal with a height here of 10 millimeters. And you see the crack was in the same belt metal. This is just what I said before, the illustration of what I said before. The same belt metal with the same probably quotation mark, uh, intrinsic toughness. But the crack resistance is substantially lower. And here when, it, when he made it even thinner, only 5 millimeters here, it's even more lower. Oh, very little is left here in terms of toughness, also the crack still stays with the same material. So I think this is a very nice, uh, this work is a very nice uh, illustration, example um, of uh, the interactions between identical materials, you just change a geometrical parameter. Oh, once again here, yeah. 
Now, I said, let's go back. Uh, we need the plastic limit load for um, such a compound material because it's no longer net section times yield strength. It's, as you have seen, it is more complex because we have different kinds of trikes, stress trikes, allergies. And um, you, um, you Jack Kim did uh, analysis, final element analysis for different kinds of specimens. Uh, in fact, he even created a small handbook. Handbook solutions for different geometries um, for development cracks. And here, this example is the bent bar. And um, the diagram shows the following thing. Again, the uh, famous parameter here is length normalized by this thickness of it here, which is the governing parameter. You know, at first glance, if you know, don't know anything, you start uh, working on such uh, mismatch value joints and you know, by experience, I mean, it's immediately, it speaks immediately to mind that geometry has to play a role. Now, this is complicated. You have uh, different crack sizes, you have different remaining ligaments, you have different uh, loading conditions, you have different widths of that, of that string, and so on and so forth. So I have to uh, scan a number of parameters, uh, which is quite complicated. So once again, this shows here that normalization is really very helpful. And it turned out that this is the governing parameter here. The, this length here divided by uh, this here. And for long remaining ligament, we are on the right hand side of the diagram. And if very little here is left, we are on uh, the left hand side of the diagram. Now, the result. This is one here that is even match. What we have plotted here is the yield load of the weld metal normalized by the yield load of the base plate. Here nothing happens. Now we look at overmatch. And uh, here I have uh, uh, emphasized the mismatch factor of 2. So this has a yield strength that is twice that of the base plate. And you see, as long as this stays short, the yield strength, the yield load of the beam here is twice as high as the yield load if there were no weldment. Really, twice. So the load car uh, is carried by the weldment only. Plasticity stays in the weldment. And when we increase this parameter here, this uh, one would be square, uh, and uh, two would be a bit lower square, so it's at about two or three. Then plasticity spreads over into the base plate, and all of a sudden you see, you see a dramatic drop of the yield load, and um, now we approach gradually infinitely long uh, um, remaining uh, ligament. And then the structure, the same is, by the way, true, true for other match. Um, the structure doesn't sense any more anything of the presence of a hard or soft strip within the base material, as if it were not present. You have a crack, please. So you can ignore it. For the yield load, not for fracture, I'm not talking about fracture, I'm talking about yield load. But in plasticity terms, there is no effect at all anymore. Ah, now uh, we try the validation. Uh, so far, only a little bit of theory and modeling. Um, we created a model well which was made of two different titaniums. And each titanium material different strengths, as you can see here, A and B, you see it's quite different, it's 500 to 740. Um, each material served as a weldman. And these two materials were welded together using electrobeam welding. So this weld metal didn't 
count. It was just a, a means of gluing these two particles together. And here we have A, which is overmatch, and here we have B, which is undermatch. So, and we know the bulk properties of both materials. And um, here is a crack. And we did tests, fracture tests. And we compare this with the prediction using this uh, engineering treatment model, data 5, 4, and so on and so forth. And here is the results. This diagram shows the predicted failure force versus the experimental failure force. We had this much ratios of about 1.5 uh, and 0.7. This is the one to one line where everything is identical. Oh, that can't be true here. This should be non conservative. This is red. Here, the background is red. And um, if you don't believe it here, it is beautifully visible, visible on my screen here. Yeah. But this tells me that in the future I have to be a bit more careful with these background colors. But nevertheless, so this is non-conservative because the prediction would be higher, better than the actual behavior. But when the prediction is, is lower values than the actual behavior, then we are on the conservative side, which means the structure is better than we uh, predict. So this is why I would, uh, we are quite happy with this here. Uh, this is a final example uh, from a PhD work. Uh, here this was a real steel belt, not a model belt, and, uh, with a V-groove here, and uh, here was the track. And uh, the experiment was here, and the prediction was there. Um, Please remember, we don't remember, but I'm repeating uh, myself. Once you have the solution for the limit load or the yield load, you have solved at least 90% of the problem. Why? You can see here. Here's the yield load. And beyond the yield load, due to the low hardening uh, capacity of the steel here, very little happens anyway. Okay. I think this. Uh, yeah, that was it. And um, do we have any questions? Okay. No questions. Everything crystal clear? Or totally, totally ununderstandable? Now we have uh, the task uh, of assessing the uh, integrity of a structure component. 
containing a crack like defect. Um, and uh, I define five fundamental tasks that can be worked on. It is uh, the determination of either the critical load or the critical defect size or the receiver lifetime, which is probably the most important one, the inspection intervals and the amount of requirements for non destructive uh, inspection. The residual life is um, really important in so far as um, whenever you detect a crack, uh, you have to answer the question in, in a running uh, a component, you have to answer the question, do I have to shut down this thing immediately? Or can I work on it for the next uh, half year, two years, or whatever? And uh, this, uh, the answer to this question can save or cost an awful lot of money. Uh, for example, uh, in a steel mill, there was the case of a, a, a frame uh, of a big mill, and the, the frame developed a, a large crack, and uh, the uh, engineer in charge had to answer that question. Closing down, I mean, it was clear that the frame had to be replaced. Um, but uh, the answer to this question uh, was very critical because had it to be shut down immediately, um, an extremely long downtime would have been the consequence because you can't buy a frame for a specific steel mill just off the shelves. It has to be made specifically. And you can't get it um, next week. So usually it may take half a year or a year or even longer. So in the meantime, your uh, factory goes bankrupt. It's really that severe. I mean, uh, remember a case of that. And uh, so it was decided to continue, but to um, carefully monitor the crack and its development. And in the end, uh, it worked out fine, but immediately the new frame was ordered so that uh, the uh, replacement part came, came in time. So these are really uh, critical things. And um, I mean, speaking of cracks, uh, cracks have not been invented by factory mechanics. Um, we have cracks everywhere. Um, in the early days of railroading, we had uh, many, many failures due to fatigue cracks. Um, we have cracks in every aeroplane that has flown several thousands of hours and all the, the rivet holes. So uh, a plane can really have uh, many cracks, which is of no concern if uh, the cracks are known and carefully monitored, so no, no concern about that. Uh, because um, the aerospace structures live on our ability to assess the severity of such a crack. Okay. Um, here I'm recommending a book uh, by Zerbs, uh, Schödel, Webster, and Ainsworth. Um, this is a compilation of two European programs, Syntac and Fitnet, and it describes uh, the assessment procedures developed here um, uh, in details with case studies, and uh, it's really a very good book, but not easy to read. Uh, it is not a, not a novel, you know, not easy to work on, but it really contains everything that you need. Uh, including uh, specialties for thin wall structures. By the way, the thin wall structures were introduced by, by order. Well, when we have a crack, our component or complete structure must be tolerant. We must have some tolerance against uh, the crack. And um, we know or require so that some critical crack propagation cannot always be excluded. And uh, during the lifetime, the projected lifetime for uh, stationary structures is frequently 30 years or 40 years. And um, the crack 
could reach a critical size. So for this, uh, we need uh, an analysis of track propagation using factor mechanics. And uh, this analysis um, has to make sure that the critical size will never be reached either within the projected lifetime or between two inspections. So a little bit of text more. Um, it can be tolerate tracks. Um, here's some definition I think uh, uh, we have to look at that. Damage tolerance does not mean that some critical cracks are really tolerated. Although it can be an option, uh, it should be used with care and it's not given if you have safety critical components. Uh, in uh, an aeroplane, for example, it's the discs of the turbines. I mean, turbine blades can fail. This happens uh, sometimes. It makes a little bit of noise. Uh, but, uh, Critical is um, the failure of this. And this happened many years ago um, in an Airbus engine. And the point is the, the disc rotates, or the turbine rotates with an extremely high um, speed. And uh, when the, the disc breaks, you have kind of a, um, of a saw that runs straight through the fuselage doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, plane crashes, it depends on the circumstances, but at least a number of people die who are hit by, by that so uh, it's really awful. But that was um, as far as I remember my traction. So in, in aerospace structures people uh, refer to class one materials. Class one materials are those materials uh, on the failure of which would lead to uh, an accident. Uh, based on this, um, we have uh, found a, uh, created a similar definition for railways um, in cooperation, by the way, with Professor Stefan Abereva in, uh, in Milano, who is a great expert in, in this, uh, this area. It's a failure of wheels, of axles, and of rails. And all these failures can cause, um, necessarily do, and can cause um, derailment. Um, maybe a little story. I showed you, Monday morning I showed you that crash of the ice train in, uh, in Germany. And uh, I think it was last year, already two years ago. Sometimes I have difficulties because time is running and life goes by quite quickly, faster than you believe. So make the best out, out of your life. There was a, one of the um, ice train, uh, dry trains, uh, third generation, which runs at uh, 300 kilometers between Frankfurt and Köln. And the train came from the high speed line uh, into Köln, and uh, when the train uh, um, went further to Dortmund, it has, had to reverse directions. And whenever you have been to Köln by train, you would have seen that on the, uh, when the train from the right side approaches the station, there's a sharp curve. And uh, so the trains are very slow when they run on this uh, sharp curve. And um, one of these uh, ice, third generation ice trains derailed. Nothing happened, nothing bad happened, you know, it was low speed. And, uh, but People got hair rising, you know, because uh, had that happened on the high speed line at 300 kilometers, that would have been ended up in a disaster. Plus, this would have been the second event after the one I showed you Monday morning. Our authorities, and this is for sure, I know it for sure. Our authorities would have closed all high-speed trains in Germany. Full stop. Because there are frequent problems with, with accidents. Okay, uh, and that's why the trains have to go to inspections every 30,000 kilometers until new axles uh, have been produced. 30,000 kilometers, which is every every now and then. Previously, it was over 300,000. 
can you imagine the amount of money and uh, the amount of loss of credibility? There was a time when one half of the high-speed trains was grounded. I mean, this is a term for aeroplanes, had, had to be stopped. So there was no, sometimes no train service at all, or the um, fast trains had to be replaced by slower ones, and passengers complained, you know, all this, all what, what comes uh, after that. And the, uh, it's not yet uh, repaired, uh, it is underway, but the whole thing is not yet repaired, and uh, they are slowly implementing also new axles. And, uh, so this, um, and here it's uh, where fracture mechanics uh, comes into play. Now, the story, it's not, not finished. Uh, a few months ago, I attended the presentation of one of the people who did the failure investigation of that low-speed uh, derailment. And the guy came to the conclusion, it is a provisional conclusion because the, the fracture surface was uh, uh, quite damaged. You could see it on the, on the picture. And he said, if the assumptions that I am making, please model okay, assumptions, are correct, then the axle was already broken on the high speed line. But this shows the stability of um, vehicles with bogies. You know? Because each bogey has two axles. When one axle breaks, there's a fair chance that the train can uh, reach its, its home harbor, so to speak, uh, which happened uh, in that uh, instance. But once again, imagine it had happened at high speed. Okay. Yeah, uh, the time span from detection to failure has to be sufficiently long to develop a useful inspection plan. We'll see details later. And uh, the critical pack size has to be determined with high accuracy. Um, now there's a number of parameters that we need. It's your high loads, of course, uh, residual stresses. There are several uh, sources of residual stresses which are often ignored. In many failure cases, uh, for many failure cases, residual stresses are blamed because nobody knows the exact magnitude so, of oh, residual stresses. <coughs> I'm not joking, it is uh, reality. The mass forces, think of turbines for example, thermal stresses. You need the, to know the location of crack initiation. We have to consider local stress raises. And uh, when we are cycling loading, the variation of loading with time is critical. We have seldom constant amplitude loading. We have uh, mostly variable amplitude loading. And for example, an aeroplane, a wing, or whatever part of an aeroplane, of the structure of the plane, not the turbine, um, sees um, a wide variety of applied uh, load cycles. But the uh, positive message is the good news, the positive news. The flights a plane <coughs> undertakes are usually not identical but similar. So people attach uh, strain gauges on critical parts. They do flights, normal uh, passenger flights or test flights. Uh, sometimes with sharp maneuvers, with high uh, acceleration here, uh, which happens when uh, uh, a plane goes through a, a storm cloud, uh, uh, which can be an awful experience, an awful experience for the passenger. And uh, so um, then we have uh, a stress distribution for um, a flight from takeoff to landing. And um, this is then uh, carefully studied, and then people say, this is one load cycle, you know, composed of whatever. 
and each flight a load cycle and uh, 1,000 flights mean uh, 1,000 load cycles, so it makes testing and calculation easier. Yeah, um, this is a bit of a picky thing, uh, distinguish between four pack sizes. <coughs> the uh, A, I, <coughs> is the maximum crack that cannot propagate during service because we have cracks, for example, in belly joints, a small crack uh, that is there, but of no concern because it can't propagate. So it's the longest crack which can't propagate. And the minimum size that can, sorry here, that cannot be found at the end of production, it happens here, cannot be found. Sorry about that. And the crack A NDI, which is the crack size corresponding to the detection limit of NDI, and that's A critical of the critical crack size of failure. So this A NDI is a um, difficult thing. I'm referring to it at the end of our talks here. <coughs> we need the stress strain curve. We need the materials resistance. Um, then for cycle coding, uh, we uh, need a, a tool for pro uh, predicting cut propagation, the NASCO equation. It's the one that I referred to yesterday when I said Jim Newman has created something based on crack closure and uh, it has the title NASCO for uh, this now um, second generation NASCO equation. So you have a tool, and this is the equation by the way here. Um, R is the stress ratio, K max the maximum stress intensity factor, here we have the threshold, this is the critical one, and the parameters Q, P, N, and F have to be determined by, I guess it's plugged into this Nasco uh, equation. Yeah, and as far as I know, uh, it is, um, uh, can be downloaded. And once again, please, uh, if anybody of you uh, has a, a question or problem to be solved, which does not um, come up uh, this time, you can send me an email. Uh, my email address is available, and um, try to either answer directly or refer you to a relevant expert. OK, then I think we should make a, a break. Uh, it's 30 minutes OK, a quarter to, a quarter to 11. Multi-purpose break. Okay, see you in quarter to 11.